Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's Senate occasional lecture. My name's Tim Bryant, and I'm the Clerk Assistant Committees in the Department of the Senate. In welcoming you, I'd like to acknowledge and show my respect to the traditional custodians of this land and their elders, past and present. I would also like to acknowledge other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who may be present. The 1970s was a decade of important developments in parliamentary accountability in Australia. In 1970, the modern Senate committee system was born with the establishment of a comprehensive set of standing and estimates committees. The Senate estimates committees in particular heralded a new era for the parliament's ability to hold the executive government to account. For the first time, public servants directly appeared before senators to answer questions on the government's budget and the operation of its programs. In parallel with this development was the rise of the ministerial advisor where ministers once relied largely on their departments for advice, a new political class evolved between ministers and the public service. To speak on the implications of this for responsible government in Australia, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr Yi Fui Ng. Dr Ng is a lecturer in the Graduate School of Business and Law at RMIT University. She researches in public law and politics with a particular interest in the influence of ministerial advisers and lobby groups on executive government. She has also worked within the executive herself as a policy advisor at the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet, a senior legal advisor at the Victorian Department of Premier and Cabinet, and as a manager at the Victorian Department of Justice. Her book, Ministerial Advisers in Australia, The Modern Legal Context, was published last year. Please join with me in welcoming Dr Ng. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for coming on this winter day. Um, I did spend two very happy years of my life in Canberra, and it is a great pleasure to return, and it's an honour to be here to speak to you today. So, um, so first of all, my talk is based on my book, Ministerial Advisors in Australia, The Modern Legal Context, um, which is an, a very exciting title. I know I came up with it myself. Um, but in that context, I would like to thank my publisher from the Federation Press, Jason Monaghan, who has come from interstate to be here today. I could not have hoped for a more supportive publisher. Thank you very much. And I'm very happy to see some of my friends in the audience as well. And thanks for everybody else who've come as well. So first of all, it's very hard to feel sorry for politicians, but yet it is undeniable that a modern day politician has many different responsibilities, including managing policy, the media, and political issues. Ministers also have to mediate with and appease various stakeholders, including constituents and interest groups. Within the political structure, they have to work cooperatively with their prime minister, members of parliament, and their political party. It is impossible for one person to shoulder all of these tasks single-handedly. Newly elected ministers are faced with a vast and bewildering bureaucracy inherited from the previous government. Although the public service is meant to be impartial, ministers may not be willing to trust the bureaucracy which had just been serving their opponents a few moments ago. Ministers understandably have the desire to have partisan advisers whom they trust to advise them. And this has led to the rise of the ministerial advisor. Ministerial advisers are personally appointed by ministers and work out of the minister's private offices. In the last 40 years, ministerial advisers have become an integral part of the political landscape. In the last 40 years, ministerial advisers have um, it started from the informal kitchen cabinet, where a small group of the minister's trusted friends and advisers 
gathered around the kitchen table to discuss political strategies. This has since become formalized and institutionalized into the role of the partisan ministerial advisor as distinct from the impartial public service. The number of Commonwealth ministerial staff increased from 155 in 1972 to 423 in 215, an increase of 173%. Ministerial advisors undertake a wide range of functions. Tony Nutt, a former ministerial advisor, stated that a ministerial advisor deals with the press, a ministerial advisor handles the politics, a ministerial advisor talks to the union. All of that happens every day of the week, everywhere in Australia, all the time, including, frankly, the odd bit of, you know, ancient Spanish practices and a bit of bastardry on the way through. That's all the nature of politics. So I don't swear in my normal life, so this is the, um, it gives me a perverse pleasure to say the word bastardry in Parliament House. So this is a pinnacle of achievement for me. <laughs> so in my research, I interviewed two, 22 current and former ministers and members of parliament, including four former premiers, two former treasurers, five former senior ministers, one leader of the Greens and two former speakers of the House. A strong theme that comes through the interviews is that ministerial advisors are extremely influential. The interviewee stated that some ministerial advisors, such as the chief of staff of the prime minister and very senior ministers, were more powerful than many ministers and members of parliament. Former Deputy Premier John Thwaites stated that often the ministerial advisors you find in the prime minister's and premier's office are more powerful than some ministers the head of the media unit, the chief of staff, and maybe one or two advisors in the prime minister's and premier's office are more powerful, have more influence on the decision-making in most cases than certainly junior ministers and more than most ministers. Some ministerial advisors are also given significant discretion to speak on their minister's behalf. Beyond this, there is an intimacy that develops between ministers and their advisors due to the high pressure political environment and long working hours involved in the minister's office. Former Minister Lindsay Tanner stated that there is an intimacy in the ministerial office. People work ridiculous hours. You are living in each other's pockets. It is a relatively small area. You are under intense pressure. So the perceived power of ministerial advisors, some of it just arises from that intimacy. And by definition, you have access and you're talking about the weather or the football. And so there's a trust and there's a bond. And there's a much more fertile ground for these kinds of exchanges than someone who's coming in to see you every two days. Former min Premier Steve Brax said that ministers may see their advisors more than they see their partner. You yeah, know, poor partners, right? So this creates a relationship forged in fire, leading to intimacy, trust and confidence between ministers and their advisors. Peter Credlin, Chief of Staff to former Prime Minister Tony Abbott, is a notable example of a formidable ministerial advisor who was widely regarded as one of the most powerful figures in Australian politics. She was rated as Australia's most powerful woman in the Australian Women's Weekly Power 100 list and was ranked as number one in Business Review's weekly um, Spinners and Advisors Power Index. And yes, there is a Spinners and Advisors Power Index. So there were frequent media reports about Credlin giving directions to and berating ministers and members of parliament. Credlin also sat in on cabinet meetings and vetted ministerial staff selection and media appearances to their consternation. As the Liberal Insider said, she's tough, she's the player, she makes demands, she gives directions, she balls people out. 
Credlin undoubtedly had a lot more power and influence than most ministers. The star of ministerial advisors has well and truly risen. At the same time, there is a reduction in the influence of the public servants relative to ministerial advisors. For instance, former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd would ignore his department for months at a time and essentially froze the secretary of his department out. Consequently, ministerial advisers became his primary source of advice. But perhaps the reduction of public service influence is best illustrated by a story told by one of the interviewees. He was at the opening of Monash Sucho, which was attended by the Victorian Premier, the Premier's Chief of Staff and the Departmental Secretary. There was one chair in the front row for the Departmental Secretary, but not the Chief of Staff. The Chief of Staff said to the Departmental Secretary, move over. And the Secretary moved. The Chief of Staff sat in the front row. So this is a nice visual illustration of the shift of that locus of power from the public service to the advisors. So there has thus been a significant change in the structure of the executive due to the addition of ministerial advisors as an additional layer between ministers and public servants. However, ministers and public servants are subject to elaborate administrative law accountability frameworks, while ministerial advisors operate in a fluid, largely unregulated universe. The insertion of ministerial advisors into the executive can be seen as part of the new public management imperative to increase the responsiveness of the public service to the elected politicians. Former Prime Minister Paul Keating noted that the public service reforms of the 1980s were intended to bolster the position of ministers compared to public servants, as well as to increase the responsiveness of the public service. Former Minister David Kemp said that the intent of the ministerial staff system was to counter the impact of the imperial public service that was not elected and had an excessive influence on government and was not under the control of the elected government. This shows that the motivation for the introduction of the ministerial staff system was to directly counteract the influence of the public service on the minister, as well as to enhance the efficiency of the system. However, I argue that the rise of ministerial advisors shows the triumph of efficiency over accountability. This is particularly clear in terms of the appearances of ministerial advisers before parliamentary committees. In a couple of incidents, ministerial advisers have been banned from appearing before parliamentary committees on a basis that there is a constitutional convention that they do not appear. This happened in the Children Overboard incident at the Commonwealth level and the Hotel Windsor incident at the Victorian level. In the Children Overboard incident in 2001, the Prime Minister claimed that an asylum seeker boat was exceptional. The passengers had thrown their own children overboard. Within several days, a few public servants found out that the Children Overboard story was false. They notified a ministerial advisor of the defence minister about this. Nonetheless, ministers continued to make public statements about asylum seekers throwing children overboard as part of an election strategy. When pressed for evidence, the press secretary of the defence minister asked the public servant to email two photographs to him. The photos were actually of two brave Navy sailors who rescued terrified asylum seekers and their children in the open sea when their boat sank. The press secretary was informed soon after that that the photos were not of the children overboard incident, but of the rescue operation. The ministers released these photographs as evidence of children being thrown overboard. <clears throat> 
Even after being made aware that the photos were misleading, the ministers did not correct the public record. A Senate committee was formed to investigate the children overboard incident. The government refused to allow ministerial advisers to appear before the parliamentary committee, claiming that there was a constitutional convention that ministerial advisers do not appear before Commonwealth parliamentary committees. The Senate committee was highly critical of this, stating that such bans and refusals are anathema to accountability. At the state level, Peter Duke, a media advisor to the Minister for Planning, had a bad day in 2010. She accidentally sent an email to the journal, a journalist at the ABC instead of her manager, as we all do, as we all do. So the email contained the minister's media plan, which stated that the minister's office intended to run a sham public consultation for the $260 million redevelopment of the iconic Hotel Windsor. In an interview, the minister denied any knowledge of the media plan or strategy. The minister said that Ms Duke used inappropriate language and poetic license in a speculative document. A Legislative Council Standing Committee created an inquiry into the Hotel Windsor redevelopment planning process. The Victorian Attorney General refused to allow ministerial advisers to appear before the Parliamentary Committee, um, and the Parliamentary Committee concluded that its investigations were significantly hindered as a result of the Attorney General's interference. The Children Overboard and Hotel Windsor incident highlights a method that ministers can use to effectively evade their responsibility to Parliament. First, they refuse to appear before the Upper House Committee on the basis that they have an immunity from being summoned by the other House of Parliament. They then blame ministerial advisers for certain actions or inactions and distance themselves from the actions of their advisers. Following this, they forbid their advisers from appearing before parliamentary committees and making any other public appearances. In this way, both the ministers and the ministerial advisers do not appear before the upper house committee to provide an explanation, accept a sanction and provide rectification. Thus, all facets of accountability are undermined. Um, from explanatory accountability, where the minister explains their actions, to the minister accepting any sanction for their behaviour and undertaking remedial action to rectify and any public issues. If both ministers and ministerial advisers do not appear before parliamentary committees, ministers are able to effectively escape scrutiny for their actions and deny responsibility for controversial events or policies. This creates an accountability gap where no one takes explanatory or amendatory responsibility for public controversies and scandals. Consequently, the basic tenet of responsible government that seeks to ensure executive accountability is undermined. This is failure at a systemic level where ministers are able to utilise ministerial advisers to avoid their own responsibility to parliament. In terms of the law, Parliament has very strong powers to summon witnesses to appear before parliamentary committees. Section 49 of the Constitution imports the powers and privileges of the United Kingdom's House of Commons in 1901. This includes the power to compel the attendances of witnesses, arrest those who do not comply, and compel those witnesses to answer their questions. This was preserved by the Commonwealth Parliamentary Privileges Act, which was passed as a form of partial declaration of the powers, privileges and immunities of Parliament. Generally, Commonwealth Parliamentary Committees are given the power to call for witnesses and documents. However, the source of their power differs based on the committee. 
Standing and select committees derive their powers from standing orders or resolutions of the House, while committees established under statute have the power to call for witnesses and documents provided by statute. So it is clear that the Commonwealth Houses of Parliament and parliamentary committees have the power to order the appearance of persons and the production of documents. Where a person does not attend a parliamentary committee despite an order by the committee, the committee cannot punish the individual directly, but must report the matter to the House. The House can then punish for contempt those who do not comply with their orders. Section 7 of the Parliamentary Privileges Act provides the Commonwealth Houses of Parliament with the power to impose punishment for contempt, including imprisoning a person for six months or imposing a fine of $5,000 on an individual or $25,000 on a corporation. So here we have a disjuncture between law and politics, where the legal position is clear that Parliament has the power to summon ministerial advisers to appear before parliamentary committees, while there is a political or constitutional convention claimed that ministerial advisers do not appear before parliamentary committees. My research tells yet another story about the existence of a constitutional convention regarding ministerial advisers appearing before parliamentary committees. Constitutional conventions are quite mysterious creatures. There is no general consensus as to when a constitutional convention arises and all the essential features of the convention. However, there are a few features that are said to characterise constitutional conventions. These are that conventions are not law. Political participants believe that the convention is binding and arguably the conventions have a reason. I have conducted interviews with current and former ministers and members of parliament about their beliefs as to whether there is a constitutional convention that ministerial advisers do not appear before parliamentary committees. The literature shows that the belief of political participants is an essential element of conventions being formed. From my interviews, all nine Commonwealth politicians did not believe that a convention had been formed, that ministerial advisers could not appear before parliamentary committees in all circumstances. Two political participants believed that there was a convention that ministerial advisers could appear voluntarily or in exceptional circumstances. Former ministers Kim Carr and Peter Costello objected to ministerial advisers appearing before parliamentary committees on the basis that it allows ministers to evade their own accountability to parliament by allowing the advisor to take the blame for controversies. For example, Peter Costello was worried that ministers would seek to sh shift the blame to their advisers. He said, to me, it would look very weak if you sent your advisers in to take the rap for you. However, Carr and Costello agreed that ministerial advisers could appear voluntarily or under summons in exceptional circumstances. A majority of the participants believed that there was no binding constitutional convention preventing ministerial advisers from appearing before parliamentary committees. Two participants explicitly denied that there was such a convention. For instance, Anna Burke, former Speaker of the House of Representatives, disagreed that there was a convention that ministerial advisers do not appear before parliamentary committees. Burke argued that ministerial advisers should appear before parliamentary committees in certain circumstances, including when they provided policy advice in the context of an issue or event, or such as the Hotel Windsor incident, or where there was conflict of interest or corruption involved, as public servants appear before committees on similar issues. Conversely, she thought that advice by ministerial advisers on media perceptions, such as whether the Prime Minister should wear powder blue ties, did not need to be disclosed. 
Burke stated that ministerial advisers should have appeared in the Children Overboard incident and the Hotel Windsor incidents as their version of events would have assisted the process and understanding of the outcome. Many believe that the precedent of the children overboard incident was not binding and they could change their position in the future. Two participants took a very cynical view towards conventions generally. For instance, a former senior Liberal minister stated that conventions are only practiced until they are broken. Um, similarly, former Minister Lindsay Tanner stated that conventions can be in the eye of the beholder and do not survive a brutal assault driven by political reasons. On an issue of this kind, people tend to do whatever suits their short-term political in interest and try to dress them up as some kind of vaguely credible precedent. But in truth, and what you probably find, is that Various parties will adopt contradictory positions depending on whether or not they are in government or in opposition. At the Victorian level, except for one political actor, all interviewees rejected the existence of a constitutional convention. Former Premier John Brumby, who was Premier at the time of the Hotel Windsor incident, stated that he believed that there was a long-standing convention that ministerial advisers are not called and do not appear before parliamentary committees. He said, at the end of the day, you've got to have some limits on who you call. Is it your personal staff? Is it your executive assistant? Is it your partner? At the end of the day, it is the minister who is responsible. It is clearly correct that it is necessary to draw the line about who should be called before parliamentary committees. However, the difference between ministerial advisers and a minister's partner is that ministerial advisers exercise significant public functions and may be able to shed light on issues discussed by parliamentary committees. <coughs> Ten other Victorian political participants did not feel bound by a constitutional convention that ministerial advisers do not appear before parliamentary committees. Rather, when in opposition, they would feel free to change their position on the issue. The general consensus from the Victorian interviews is that at the very least, ministerial advisers should appear when they are acting independently, but not be required to speak on policy. For example, former Premier Steve Bragg said, I don't think there's any such convention, number one. Number two, it's a matter of practice, and my view is that if the minister is required to attend, you should use the same test for an advisor attending. They are one and the same. On that basis, Brex thought that ministerial advisers should have appeared before parliamentary committees in the Children Overboard and Hotel Windsor incidents. Former Premier John Cain thought that ministerial advisers should appear before parliamentary committees where their functions intrude into government bureaucratic processes, such as when they comment upon advice to the minister. However, where ministerial advisers are advising on political, factional or intra-party issues, then Cain thought it was not appropriate for advisers to appear before parliamentary committees. He stated that the refusal to allow ministerial advisers to appear before parliamentary committees where they provided public policy advice was self-serving by the minister of the day. Greg Barber, leader of the Victorian Greens Party, who was a member of the parliamentary committee in the Hotel Windsor incident, stated that what we have here is not so much a convention, we have a straight-out agreement between Labour and Liberal that neither of them wants to upset the apple cart. None of them want to bring ministerial advisers into a formal system. They like them out there in the never-never world. Therefore, from the interviews, the conventional requirement that the rule be considered binding by the political participants is not satisfied at the Commonwealth and the Victorian levels. 
There is thus no constitutional convention that ministerial advisers are prevented from appearing before parliamentary committees. Besides the beliefs of the political participants, another element of a constitutional convention being formed is arguably that the convention has a reason. There is disagreement about amongst commentators about the importance of the requirement of a reason and the type of reason that is required. The weight of the literature, however, indicates that the reasons for the convention should be consistent with fundamental democratic principles. The reason that ministerial advisers are prohibited from appearing before parliamentary committees is purportedly to fulfil the requirements of responsible government. The argument advanced is that ministerial advisers are accountable to their minister personally, while ministers are then accountable to parliament. This rationale has been called the McMullen Principle, after statements made by Senator Bob McMullen to this effect. Nevertheless, even Senator McMullen, to whom the alleged convention has been attributed, has since clarified that there should not be an accountability gap where both ministers and their advisers escape accountability. He said, there is a long-standing principle which I have articulated. In fact, to my embarrassment, I saw it reported in one place as the McMullen Principle which says staff are responsible to ministers, ministers are responsible to the parliament. In the normal course, that is correct, but that means you have to accept responsibility for what your staff do. You cannot say they're responsible to me, but I do not care what they do. I am not going to tell you what they do. If they make a mistake, it's nobody's business. So then there is a black hole of accountability because they deal with departments. They give instructions, they receive directions. Either ministers have to accept responsibility for what their staff do, or staff have to be accountable. It cannot be that nobody is accountable. In addition, the so-called McMullen principle is weak as public servants are similarly accountable to their minister, who is then linked to the chain of accountability to parliament. Unlike ministerial advisers, public servants routinely appear before parliamentary committees. Their presence is to give an account of their actions to parliament, while responsibility for their actions fall on their minister, who may be censured in parliament. The appearance of ministerial advisers before parliamentary committees would be to perform a similar function. Further, preventing ministerial advisers from appearing before parliamentary committees does not seem to closely embody the principle of responsible government. This is because there are strong incentives for actors within the executive to shift blame wherever possible. Consistent with the public choice theory, politicians have the incentive to deflect all blame that comes in their direction while accepting the credit for anything that goes right towards achieving what Christopher Hood and Martin Lodge call the political nirvana of a system of executive government in which blame flows downwards to the bureaucracy while credit flows upwards to the ministers. Of course, there are exceptions where ministers have personal ethics and integrity. However, by and large, ministers have the overriding incentive to shift blame to another locus. I argue, therefore, that there is no legitimate reason to prevent ministerial advisers from appearing before parliamentary committees. Indeed, ministerial advisers have appeared before parliamentary committees in South Australia five times, both voluntarily and under summons for controversial issues. For instance, three ministerial advisers appeared under summons before a parliamentary committee about the handling of a case where a school child was sexually abused. There has also been precedent in New South Wales for ministerial advisers appearing before a parliamentary committee, both voluntarily and under summons. 
And in Western Australia, ministerial advisers appear before parliamentary committees as an uncontested matter, both to provide details of legislative bills and in situations of controversy, including the government's decision to close the Swan Valley Aboriginal community following incidents of child abuse and family violence. Jeff Gallup, former Western Australian Premier, stated that he strongly believed that ministerial advisers should appear before committees. He said, they have to appear before parliamentary committees. You can't have a minister saying, I'll take responsibility and appear before the committee and then be in a position to say, oh, well, I didn't know anything about that because I wasn't told without having any ministerial advisers ask the same questions. I think it's rather silly. I think it creates an accountability gap that has to be filled. Ministerial advisers are an important part of the system. And in that sense, I think that they are accountable the same way as ministers are accountable to the public interest. And the public interest is protected by parliament. And when parliament inquires into something, they should get all the evidence that they need. It's never been an issue in Western Australia. They have had to appear, and they did. It is hence only the, only the Commonwealth and Victoria who make that self-interested claim that there's a constitutional convention that ministerial advisers are prevented from appearing before parliamentary committees. This shows that there is no valid reason for the convention that is consistent with democratic principles, and thus there is no convention. Therefore, there is currently a stalemate between the government and parliament about the appearances of ministerial advisers before parliamentary committees. The law is very clear that houses of parliament and parliamentary committees have very strong powers to compel witnesses to appear and compel the production of documents. However, the politics of the situation has played out differently. In a few incidents, ministerial advisers have been banned from appearing before parliamentary committees on the basis that there is a constitutional convention that they do not appear. The empirical research I have conducted demonstrates that political participants do not regard themselves as being bound by any rules about ministerial advisers appearing before parliamentary committees. In short, ministerial advisers fall in the gap between law and convention. This has happened because there are fractures and fissures in our conceptualization of the executive, legal, political and managerial. Our legal understanding of the executive in Australia is permeated from its historical roots in the United Kingdom. The monarch formed the original basis of executive power and there are continuing links as Australia remains a constitutional monarchy. However, over the years, the High Court has been increasingly keen to assert a uniquely Australian version of the executive and executive power, which is derived from Section 61 of the Constitution rather than the prerogative powers inherited from the United Kingdom. The Australian Constitution provides a strong framework of executive accountability through parliamentary control of executive spending and judicial review of decisions of officers of the Commonwealth. This means that the Constitution sets up a scheme of watchful supervision and scrutiny of the executive by the other branches of government. The legal controls are generally effective in constraining the, decision of the decisions of ministerial advisers. However, this form of accountability is limited to a very small subset of the actions of ministerial advisers that trespass into the boundaries of exercising executive power. The political narrative shares the same backbone as the legal narrative through the principles of ministerial responsibility and responsible government. <clears throat> 
However, the political narrative emphasizes the reduced role of parliament due to the strong influence of political parties. The political narrative of the executive is often expressed as a lament by external commentators by, about the Westminster system being circumvented by politicians in conjunction with the cynical manipulation of the concepts of ministerial responsibility and responsible government by politicians towards short-term political ends. This, this leads to a weak form of accountability where the government and the opposition take differing positions, not based on principle, but based on political expediency. At the same time, each of the major political parties has an incentive not to push too hard on the issue of ministerial advisers. This systemic flaw is shown by ministerial advisers not appearing before parliamentary committees as ministers seek to evade their own responsibility to parliament and strategically utilise ministerial advisers to evade their accountability. This leads to an accountability vacuum. Oh, beautiful music. So the managerial account of the executive seeks to enhance the efficiency and effectiveness of the operations of the executive. The focus is on adopting private sector principles to improve the functioning of the executive. Public servants are seen to be can-do managers who have to operate in a business-like way. However, an excessive focus on efficiency can undermine accountability. This is because the executive is not a simple private sector body whose predominant goal is profit maximisation. Rather, the executive has a range of additional responsibilities in addition to efficiency, such as the requirements of accountability, procedural fairness and transparency. Therefore, there are fractures and fissures in the way that we conceptualise the executive in Australia. The legal, political and managerial narratives have different underlying values, and there is currently no coherent way to resolve clashes between these different values. The disjuncture between the legal, political and managerial narratives leads to systemic failures of accountability. To sum up, there are failings at an institutional level in the Australian system of public administration. This has been exacerbated by the rise of ministerial advisers in the Australian system of government, the manipulative behaviour of politicians and the unreflective adoption of the new public management efficiency approach. So here we are caught between law and convention, continuity and change. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was fascinating. And as somebody who's, whose day job is running the Senate committee system, which is trying to hold the executive to account, um, I've been taking lots of notes and I think I'll make your lecture compulsory viewing for all the staff. <laughs> um, we've now got an opportunity for questions. And because we're not in the theatre, um, I'll invite, so it's a bit steep and horrible in there, but nice flat surface here. So I'd, I'd invite people to make their way to the microphone um, and ask a question perhaps around ministerial accountability. I mean, uh, the accountability of ministerial advisers, I should say. I can't believe that there isn't a question out there somewhere. Um, my only uh, brush with ministerial advisers was a, a session as a DLO uh, in 2000, 2007 in the um, education minister's office. Um, and that was uh, a very formative experience, understanding how uh, ministerial advisers work. In my naivety, when I first went into the minister's office, uh, I was under the impression that the ministerial advisers were there as subject matter experts. Um, I was, some were, uh, but not necessarily all of them. Anyway, I think we have a question at the back there. Dr Riggins, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. I think a dilemma that faces many public servants, and I was a public servant for many years before I came to work here, um, is when a ministerial advisor rings a public servant and says, 
the minister wants you to do X, and the public, service is very, public servant is very uncomfortable with what, whatever the task is because it may not be appropriate, it may not even be legal. Um, it's very much a grey area, and I was wondering if you could comment on that because you talked about people like Ms Credlin having a, wielding enormous power, and I think in the modern Commonwealth, ministerial advisers are the people who most public servants will deal with. And you know what your research has found about cases where the advice might or the requests from the minister's office might be inappropriate. That is a great question, and I was a former public servant as well, so experienced similar things. So the constitutional theory is that the minister and their advisers are one and the same. The advisor is the alter ego of the minister, and therefore everything the advisor says reflects what the minister actually asked the advisor to do. But in reality, what you find is that advisors, um, because they have been very influential, their numbers have grown, they often act independently of the minister. And one of the th roles that they do is to filter advice that comes to the minister. So sometimes they are acting without the minister's consent or knowledge, but it's hard for a public servant to recognise when this is the case, when certain advice has been authorised by the minister and when it hasn't. And I think that has caused a lot of problems that interface between the public service and advisors. So some jurisdictions such as Western Australia have guidelines on how public servants and ministerial advisors should interact with each other and the boundaries and what happens if a public servant is not sure when um, the whether the advice really does come from the minister or not. So that might be a good way to resolve such issues. Thank you. And another question at the back there. Dr Ung, I wondered if you had any comments on the relative power of ministerial advisers in Australia compared to other countries around the world with similar political systems? That's a great question. And um, it is actually the subject of my second book, which I am desperately <laughs> writing at the moment. So right now I'm looking at the comparatively at advisors in Australia, the United Kingdom, Canada and New Zealand. And we can see across the Westminster system, there's an increase in the power of the advisors overall, the numbers of advisors and the influence of the advisors and the types of roles that they do. So they started from purely administrative roles to public policy roles and media roles. And that has become very entrenched in all of these countries. And so the power and influence of these advisors have grown in a Westminster system which might suggest that there's some, something that ministers are not getting from public servants in these systems, that they look to alternate sources of advice. Um, but the accountability frameworks in all of these systems are quite different. So in the United Kingdom and Canada, they're a lot more highly regulated. In the UK, there's a cap of two advisors per minister. And in Canada, there's a whole bunch of legislation that regulates lobbying, conflict of interest, and so forth. So in Australia, we have a lot of advisors, but we're less worried about them for some reason. And um, if you look overseas, there's a lot more concern about the roles of these advisors and the implications for our democracy. So thank you. And, okay, one more. Oh, sorry, there's a gentleman's just got up behind you there. Uh, sorry, in the other Westminster systems that you have looked at, uh, do advise, are advisers required to appear before parliamentary committees in those systems? That's a really great question. So um, in some jurisdictions, there's been a struggle as well. So in Canada in 2010, um, the government said, oh, there's a new policy where advisers don't appear before parliamentary committees. But even after that, an advisor still appeared before parliamentary committee there. Um, in the UK, they've taken a more principled approach. So there's guidelines um, about public servants appearing before parliamentary committees called the Osmadali Rules in the UK. 
And in the UK, they changed the Osmotherly rules in 2005 to say that when the parliamentary committee specifically calls for any person, including special advisors, their version of ministerial advisors, that named person is presumed to appear. And if that person, uh, if the minister chooses to appear in that person's stead, that's okay as well. So that's, this means that somebody appears before parliamentary committees. And you can see the practice changed after that. So before this rule, um, some advisors have refused to appear. After the rule, many very major, very powerful advisors have appeared before committees, including to comment on the Iraq war and very major issues. So that has definitely created a change in the practice. And in New Zealand, nothing really goes wrong there except for <laughs> one scandal. So transparent, so accountable. So the advice of an advisor has appeared before parliamentary committees there, and um, there has been no issue. So, yeah, that's what I found. And was there one more question? On that? If you'd like to go, sir. Yeah. You had a, a conflict between the committee's ability to summons, summon people and this parliamentary convention. So was it never tested in court? I mean, did they, with the parliamentary convention argument being put up, did they no longer summon the person? I mean, I can't understand why it wasn't challenged and somehow the judiciary got involved. Sure. Um, they, so the parliamentary committee in those controversial circumstances, the, in the Children Overboard incident, the government eventually, well, the parliament eventually backed down and didn't issue a summons for the advisor to appear. So they didn't go that extra step. In the Children, oh sorry, in the Hotel Windsor incident, they did issue summons a couple of times, but the government just ignored it and said, so what, what are you gonna do about that? And nobody did bring that matter to the court. Um, there is a way of bringing the courts into the process, which is to enact legislation that says that uh, if you are in contempt of parliament, the courts can step in and impose a punishment on anybody who does not comply. So this has been done in a couple of states. So that's one option to bring in the thoughts by enacting legislation. So that's a great question. Thank you. And if there aren't any more questions, I think that brings us to the end of today's lecture. Could you thank Dr Ng for her excellent presentation? Thank you. Thank you.